Welcome everyone. Welcome to our program today on understanding the US-China summit featuring Mark Manier. It has been quite the week this last week here in Anchorage, Alaska. Right now it is 14 degrees with clear blue skies in downtown Anchorage. It has been an, a phenomenal week and we are so glad that Mark decided to come to our town this week where the snow has been falling and the sky is blue. And I hope the air and the water is fresh wherever you are from around the world joining us today. Please do say hello to us and our speaker in the chat room and let us know where you are today. If you have a question and you want to ask it, we are going to have an extensive Q&A period at the end. And you, we're trying this out where we can see everyone so that we can have questions directly from you during the Q&A. I'll be moderating the Q&A, so simply let me know you want to ask a question and then you unmute your microphone to ask that. So to let me know, you can raise your hand actually or virtually or send me a note in the chat feature and I'll call on you and you can ask a question directly of Mark at the end. If you are new to an Alaska World Affairs Council program, the World Affairs Council, Alaska World Affairs Council is part of 90 councils around the United States. And we welcome everyone listening today to join in the conversation and join us at the end during the Q&A. Super special thank you to all of our members and supporters and partners who make programs like this happen today. And it's, we wouldn't be able to do what we do without you. So thank you for supporting us. And thank you to the Juno World Affairs Council, our forever partner this year during the pandemic. We have some amazing programs coming up this week. There are a lot of them and I won't go through all of them right now, but they are definitely all worth your time. All of you who are new out there to an Alaska World Affairs Council, please put a World Affairs Council into your planner and take a lunch break with us and our virtual programs for our virtual lunch program series. We would really love to see you again this Friday. So this Friday, we have a phenomenal program coming up. It's with Dr. Jason Scott Smith, and he will be discussing income inequality during the pandemic, the widening gap. And while China seems like the biggest threat to the US, some will argue that income inequality is actually a bigger threat to the US than China. So come this Friday to see why registration is open. More information is on our website at alaskaworldaffairs.org. We have a special person who will be introducing our speaker today. Super excited about what is possible with virtual programs. We've never done this before, but we can bring in from our national office. Like I said, we're one of 90 councils around the United States and our headquarters is in Washington, DC. And we have the president and CEO of our National World Affairs Council of America, Bill Clifford, who's going to be introducing our speaker. And you might know him in this role, but you might not know that before leading the World Affairs Council of America, Bill served as the Asia Bureau Chief for the pioneering multimedia venture CBS Market Watch, where he launched and directed new bureaus in Japan and Hong Kong. He got his start in broadcast news with Asia Business News TV and was a senior correspondent in Tokyo for CNBC. Bill is the one who connected us with Mark Manier, and it is such a privilege to have Bill join us here today at the Alaska World Affairs Council program to introduce our speaker. Bill, over to you. Thank you so much, Lisa, and good afternoon, everybody. When my good friend Mark Manier last week reached out to me to ask if I knew anybody in Alaska who he could connect with when he would come to your state to cover the high level talks between US and China last week. I said, none other than Lisa Falsco and the World Affairs and the Alaska World Affairs Council would be great for you to engage with. So here we are. It's a true pleasure. Mark Manier is US correspondent based in DC for the South China Morning Post, an extremely influential newspaper in Hong Kong uh, that covers global news. Previously, he worked for two decades or so, probably or so, because I've known him since he was a young man, um, for the Wall Street Journal in China and for the Los Angeles Times in India, China, and Japan. He's covered the Chinese economy, China, and India's explosive rise and conflicts from Afghanistan to Pakistan to Iraq and many other hot spots. And wherever the top global stories are, Mark will be there with his phone, his computer, and a whole network of contacts. Um, I can vouch personally that he has indeed, because I've checked with my sources, he has camped out 
under Saddam Hussein's bridges and slept in abandoned East Timor nunneries. But I know more about his camping on Japanese tatami mats and taking spas at Japanese onsen and so forth. Mark, you're a terrific friend. It's great of you to engage with the Alaska World Affairs Council. And I can't think of anybody to bring more insight and enlightenment on US-China issues and the Quad Summit recently that uh, President Biden organized uh, to talk about Asian issues. Mark Manier, over to you. You have to unmute though, buddy. Um, thank you very much, Lisa. Thank you, Bill. Um, uh, the other thing that Bill said is he warned me that Lisa is so charming uh, that <laughs> any contact with her will end up <laughs> with your speaking to uh, the World Affairs Council. And it uh, didn't take much charming because it's an absolute pleasure to speak to you guys today. I also want to apologize. This was originally scheduled for Friday when we thought that there would only be one day of, uh, of meetings between US and China. The news gods are a, uh, a, a jealous mistress and uh, unpredictable. And so uh, we had to reschedule. So um, this, these few days have allowed me to basically to um, experience the, the warmth of Alaska. It's, people have been incredibly nice as I have tried to get um, plugged in and um, the last time I was here was for the trial of the Exxon Valdez. So it's been a while. <laughs> so let me just briefly outline what I, uh, I wanted to do is a, a quick look at um, where what has happened to US-China relations over the past couple of, of decades. And then a little bit on what's happening, um, what, what sort of the dynamics were in the meeting uh, here in Anchorage. And then uh, finally, a couple of uh, observations about something that's happened uh, within the last couple of hours that's going to add a, a banner to the works um, with the um, imposition of uh, sanctions by uh, a, a large array of nations against China. So, um, so I guess in many ways, the seminal event uh, one of the seminal events was uh, China's accession into the WTO in 2001. As most of you know, who followed international affairs and, and China, and this led to the Dragon Deck, what what um, Greg Wolf has dubbed the Dragon Decade. Uh, in Alaska's case, this led to exports from Alaska going from about 100 million to somewhere between 12 and 14 fold of that in very short order. Um, we then had the uh, global financial crisis. Uh, China came out very well. Uh, they pumped an enormous amount of funding into the Chinese and by extension, the global economy. Um, and uh, this also led to kind of the, the rise of a certain arrogance out of Beijing. Uh, a feeling that their system was um, much better equipped, that these were uh, um, the sort of outgrowth of negative sides of capitalism that had led to this. And um, around this time, we also started to see the erosion of a belief by the West in a narrative that they had uh, basically held to which was that with the WTO, as we'd seen with Japan and with the, uh, the Taiwan and South Korea and others, that over time with the, uh, with the connection to the global economy, that China would become much more like uh, most other market economies. That in a sense, you'd get, put Mickey Mouse under the door and then uh, middle-class values would happen, greater democracy, greater political, um, uh, liberalization. And um, the all the while you were seeing sort of in that 2010 to 2016 period, the rise of the rich poor gap, which I guess your next speaker uh, will be addressing, um, a huge increase in anti-globalization, um, a dislocation, uh, the labor markets got um, out of increasingly disjointed with those who had had a good middle-class income. And then 
in many ways, these were factors that led to the election of President Donald Trump. Um, that led to four years of, he immediately pulled out of the Trans-Pacific Partnership, um, the Paris Accord and uh, the adoption of America First principles, much more personality driven um, uh, foreign policy and economic policy, uh, quite mercurial when it came to China uh, early on. He was uh, quite enamored of Xi Jinping. Uh, later, we saw a rapid deterioration into trade wars, name calling, um, and uh, the rise of suspicion on a huge number of areas. Um, and capped by the phase one trade agreement that in many ways was geared toward the reelection uh, of, of Trump with his key constituents. Okay. So that brings us in many ways to this meeting that we saw last week. Um, the dynamics of this are in my mind that China has wanted this meeting more than the US. There are a couple of reasons for that. Uh, Beijing has reasoned that it wants to start engaging uh, the Biden administration before it can set its China policy and thereby influence it a bit more. And it's also very, very well aware of the Biden strategy to try to amass allies and encircle to some extent Beijing. And so by Beijing's logic is by trying to engage the US early, it will um, uh, sort of avoid some of the rising pressure that that has. Um, and a third uh, aspect of, of Beijing's uh, sort of desire for an early uh, meeting of the minds, if you will, was is that it still does view the US as very, very key uh, for its own stability and, uh, and the influence that the US has, not only in East Asia, but in, in Europe. The US on the other hand, with the Biden administration has been happier to wait. Uh, their game plan has been to review the Trump policies, not throw them out wholesale, uh, and in many ways use the uh, tough leverage that Trump uh, amassed uh, and um, see what is in the interest in their mind of the US consumer, not have some sort of wholesale uh, policies toward China, but try to bring some nuance into it and then have more time to corral allies. Um, so they've been happy to, to, to hold off a bit. At the same time, uh, both countries recognize that you can't wait forever. Uh, together, they, as we well know, uh, amount to 40% of the global economy. Much of Biden's agenda uh, moving forward indirectly depends on China, whether it's economic uh, uh, improvement in the US and the environment. Um, at the same time, both sides have come into this meeting hemmed in. Uh, China, after uh, this you know, quite mercurial years of Trump, cannot afford to look weak with its own, uh, in, that, in their case, left wing, with the, with the conservatives in, in China, the domestic constituency. And, um, and Biden cannot afford to look weak uh, either with Republicans or his own progressives. On, on a vast uh, array of issues involving China from economics to human rights. Um, so then why Alaska? Um, of course, it's the best state in the, in the country and <laughs> all of that. <laughs> um, but it's funny because I went out before, uh, I had a little time before the meeting started and I went to uh, Cars supermarket and, and a bunch of other places and just, talk to uh, what the Chinese called the Lao Lai Xing, the average man on the street about what they thought about the meeting. And a lot of it was uh, say what, what meeting? And then <laughs> why Alaska? <laughs> this is from Anchorage uh, locals. And um, so I think there were a, a few key issues at play. One is for given that the dynamics of it were that the Chinese wanted this a little more than the US, it's on US territory. So the Biden administration was making a point with that. It's far from either capital, 
which in many ways, uh, again, with all due respect to Alaska, uh, signaled that we're not gonna give this the sort of prestige that you would have with something close to uh, uh, the recognition that comes with uh, state dinners or these sorts of things. And finally, if you look at the, uh, just the geography, right? Uh, Blinken and Sullivan, so Secretary of State and the head of the National Security uh, Agency were, Council were, um, were in Seoul. <laughs> That's about 45 minutes from Beijing. And yet they made the Chinese fly all the way <laughs> over to Alaska <laughs> overnight um, and uh, with great inconvenience so that they could meet them here. So this were sort of the, some of the optics of what we saw. Also, we had weeks, days and weeks of signaling coming into this thing um, where both sides were playing it out in the press. Uh, some of the issues involved, the Chinese continued to say that this was, these were the beginning of strategic talks. Um, and uh, the Biden administration officials would say, there's nothing strategic about this. This is a one-off. Um, there were rumblings uh, coming up from the Chinese, either state media or officials saying that this meeting would deal with tariffs and the US side said, no tariffs, there's no tariffs involved. We're not gonna talk tariffs. And then there was a bit of a, some differences over Australia, uh, which has been caught in the ringer by uh, Beijing, uh, both on the economic and foreign policy side, where uh, Australia uh, indicated that the US would defend its interests uh, Kurt Campbell uh, on the um, National Security Council uh, gave an op-ed in the Sydney Morning Herald saying, we will defend you. Uh, China said, "This you're, a, you're not gonna be defended by the US. So there were a number of these issues that were going back and forth. We get to the meeting and not surprisingly, given all of the uh, bluster in, in the, uh, uh, in the press leading up to this. Uh, the format originally had been one to two minutes each uh, speaking before they went into the meetings. Uh, you all know sort of what happened. Uh, things went off the rail really quickly. Uh, Blinken went a bit long and quite, uh, um, I don't wanna say accusatory, but laid out all of the issues, the, the real, um, uh, tough issues that are between the, the two countries, whether Xinjiang and Taiwan, and laid this all out. Uh, Yang Jiechi, uh, the senior diplomat on the Chinese side, then came back with a 17 minute, uh, uh, his version of things about how the US had um, nothing to brag about, its own human rights were abysmal, that it was, uh, killing African-Americans, the Black Lives Matter issue, uh, that it does not speak for the global community, um, uh, on and on. Um, there was a little quip at the end, which you probably heard where uh, Yang Jie Chu said, uh, did you get all that to the translator? Uh, this will really test your capabilities. And then Blinken um, uh, quipped back that uh, the translator deserved a raise. Um, so we have then a culture gap on a couple of counts above me on everything. The Chinese tend to like, uh, when they come into these negotiations, tend to like looking at things from the standpoint of the concept. So, and, and the increasingly frustrated uh, Americans tend to want specifics, concrete areas where they're gonna see improvement. So for example, uh, if you look at some of the most contentious issues involving, say, Hong Kong, Xinjiang, uh, mostly those two, the Chinese want to come from a position of um, you recognize that we have sovereignty, and then we can talk about some of the details. The Americans come in, these are egregious human rights. We want concrete measures where you are gonna address these and fix these and uh, allow the global community to come in and view things on the ground. And so there's a very different approach to these to start with. And then <laughs> the, the more amusing, if you will, uh, 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 cultural issues that came out of this meeting, uh, the biggest thing that 
could, you know, the, the, the most egregious issue and there were many average Chinese was the fact that there was no dinner. Um, as someone with a, a Chinese wife, if you don't get your dinner <laughs> on time and a good, a good feed, <laughs> uh, you're in trouble. Um, and then a lot of this no way to treat guests. And uh, so this was, you know, no matter in, in Asia, everywhere face is important, but particularly in Asia, the, the ceremony is extremely important. And so these were, I think, consciously uh, uh, transgressed by the Biden administration. They, they know what they're doing. Most of them have been diplomats for a long time on the foreign policy side. They knew exactly what they were doing. Probably perhaps the prospect, what they faced in the, among Republicans sitting down to dinner, they probably wanted to avoid that. Um, so where do we stand? I would say before this morning, I was of the conclusion that they had both aired their laundry, their differences, made their stance, and that you saw very quickly after they, uh, this, this pre-meeting explosion, both sides really worked to rein it in pretty quickly. A senior official within probably an hour of that uh, made a big point of how well the meetings were going behind closed doors, that they had quite a bit in common, that it was a frank exchange of views, but both sides laid out their issues. Um, and then if you watch the Chinese state controlled press the next day, even the Global Times, which is uh, you know often a bit uh, hysterical, was all had the tone of we can work together, and this obviously came right out of the propaganda office. But what we've seen this morning uh, is uh, I don't know if you caught it, but the the U.S., the U.K., Canada, and the European Union have announced um, a unified common set of sanctions against four individuals operating in Xinjiang and one uh, entity, um, at which point China immediately slapped back uh, with their own sanctions against 10 European individuals and four entities. Um, this, we are in for some, you know, rough sledding for a while because um, uh, that's, uh, th that provides little chance that there's gonna be uh, uh, an improvement in the um, atmosphere that will allow for a slow uh, circling and recalibration and a uh, an, uh, looking at areas where they the two sides can can look, uh, work together. Okay, sorry to go on and on there, but that um, that's kind of at least in my mind some of the issues that we're grappling with. So um, onward and upward. Um, if, if we want to, would love some questions. Would love uh, any thoughts. Mark, that is so funny. Can we quote you that we're in for some rough sledding? You like that, the sledding. <laughs> I love I love that. That is such a visual that we can totally come on board with. Okay. Since I grew up in Hawaii, I should have said surfing, but at any rate, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, so like I said, we're gonna let you guys take uh, questions directly to our speaker. This is bringing virtual to life. So please do turn on your video so we can see your wonderful faces and let me know by your actual hand or a virtual hand or send me a chat if you wanna ask a question. I see Dr. Paul Dunscombe has his virtual hand up. So we'll start with you. Just simply unmute, ask your question and then kindly press mute when you're finished. Dr. Dunscombe. Howdy, and thanks very much, uh, Lisa, and thanks very much, Mark, for uh, talking to us today. Um, so uh, in the chat function, I noted that um, since, uh, and you noted also, since 2008 and the response to the Great Recession, that really seemed to give important kind of outside validation uh, to China's socialist market economy. Um, but even so, you know, they had been sort of pushing the notion of peaceful rise. They had been pushing the notion of the three represents, you know, the CCP is a big tent, uh, a much more kind of soft power focus. And yet with Xi Jinping, uh, he seems to have opted much more for a hard power um, way of proceeding. And I'm guessing what's the percentage for Xi Jinping in the hard power approach versus the soft power approach? Um, so, 
Paul, as I'm sure you know, it, the, the whole uh, arc of, of soft power in China is a very interesting uh, issue. And um, to, in, in sort of very briefly, uh, when Joe Nye came up with the concept, um, China was very wary of this, seeing it as a way that the imperialists were trying to hold it down. Uh, but then they, uh, as they have with so many other areas, realized that, wait, we can uh, try to remake this in our own interest. And so they have redefined soft power as things that um, would, would in most by traditional definitions not apply. And this includes the Belt and Road Initiative. It includes uh, aid where you, know, you are heavily dependent on Beijing arguably. And it includes a lot of this that, that would be considered hard power. In the process, they also put about 30, the estimates vary, but some 30 billion into the soft power initiative, which included the Confucius Institutes, which included uh, the media, and it also arguably included the buying in for a while of uh, assets in Hollywood <clears throat> to try to get more into films, doing joint productions, that sort of thing. Um, <clears throat> so it's a good question. I, when I ask around, it doesn't, you know, in any government, uh, bureaucratic momentum being what it is, programs continue to, to uh, go on and on and on. So it doesn't seem like they've given up on the concept, um, but they, I think a couple of things are going on. One, there's probably a bit of a conclusion that we can't win, <laughs> you know, um, because it just, they try, they try to do it their way. Uh, it doesn't really, it backfires. Uh, there's you know, there's, there's not, I don't think there's an understanding at some core level that you got to walk the walk and not just say stuff in, by the propaganda ministry. And the second very, very important thing I think is the, is the character of Xi Jinping himself. And this is a very, very defining issue. Um, and so, um, you know, I don't see them, I think in many ways I don't, they've tried, they continue to try. You saw the sort of very ham-handed way they did um, mask uh, uh, diplomacy in Europe um, uh, in the early days. Um, they've also there's been they've they've worked on vaccine diplomacy, especially in places like the Philippines and Pakistan. And some of the reporting I've seen out of there, um, people will grab an, different kinds of vaccines if ha if they have the choice. Um, so. I think basically they're much more inclined to go with, with a bit of muscle and uh, obligation, which is also why this approach by the Biden administration is so uh, daunting and, and a bit scary for them, I think, to, to have uh, allies combine forces rather than Trump's bi uh, strictly one-on-one -on -one bilateral approach. Sorry, long answer. Uh, no problem. Thank you. Okay, as we're waiting for more questions, I have one for you. So um, during the opening remarks, which you call, referred to as diplomatic spats, the, you said that the Chinese media was a buzz. And so I'm curious to what the feelings are of the Chinese people on these talks. You referenced a cartoon that went virtual where they depicted the Chinese delegates as rabbits and the Americans as eagles shouting and spitting at each other across the room. Can you elaborate on that? What What are the local Chinese feeling about this relationship and China with China and the United States? So that that's a that's a quite an interesting choice of memes that that is chosen in that right because uh, in some way eagles eat rabbits <laughs> right um, but um, I think it's it it speaks to this as an emerging nation, I think, it, no, first of all, um, only Xi Jinping can claim to know what the 1.4 billion people in, uh, in China feel. So, so a huge caveat that uh, um, these are gross generalizations. But my sense is that there is still a sense, especially if you live in China and you travel outside of you know, Beijing, Shanghai, uh, the Shenzhen, uh, Boy, uh, the the country has a long way to go. They like to project uh, the shiny uh, big cities and their um, giant uh, increase in the economy, but but they've still, you know, uh, per capita, they're still very much a 
mid-tier uh, power at this point. And so they know, I think at some level, the, the rabbit is kind of the underdog. The, we're, we, gave, we gave the eagle hell, it is my assessment of that, that uh, we, we held our own. Um, both sides, you know, I think the, the reaction has been, you know, good. Biden's guys held their own against China and uh, the Chinese, it's good. Uh, our boys uh, protected our interests against, against, uh, against the uh, big bad Americans. You know? So that's, you know, the other part of this is just as a journalist, you know, covering diplomats can be pretty dry stuff, right? They are trained uh, not to say anything incredibly eloquently. <laughs> Boy, to see, <laughs> to see this event where they just let it rip and unscripted and kept calling back the press to, to give them more uh, to report on uh, it was just amazing stuff. You can go for decades and not see this sort of drama played out. Okay, I see that Heather has a question. Looks like she's on the phone. All right, so Heather, we will come back to you unless you are able to talk right now. I know you have a question you'd like to ask our speaker. Okay, I can. I was just talking to an Anchorage reporter, but um, <laughs> about something completely different. And I say, can you call back? And he said, it's a short question. But so, um, Mark, um, thank you. Um, I have a comment and a question. Um, my comment was, I thought you were a little easy on the, um, U.S. delegation about the dinner. I had no idea they had not put on any kind of dinner, and and clearly that is that would be perceived as an insult, whether or not intended. And you would think that they could have organized something that they would clearly have called an informal dinner, um, or made sure that it didn't come across as a state dinner, and maybe had it up in the eagle's nest so people could see the view. But my question is about Hong Kong. Um, I'm a long time fan of Hong Kong. I've lived there for a while. I was actually there for the handover and I've been concerned about it as many people have ever since. But I'm wondering what your thoughts are since you were there as a journalist as well about what its future holds and if there's any way to influence um, the Chinese administration about its future democratic politically and even economically. Thank you. It's an excellent question, especially given that you know, my headquarters is in Hong Kong, so it's something very uh, close to home. Um, basically, I think the foreign policy under Xi Jinping uh, has uh, <coughs> has moved away, as we know, from the uh, the roadmap that Deng Xiaoping had had laid out of bide our time, wait, uh, you know, don't don't be confrontational, um, and. I think the Xi Jinping administration um, calculated that they, I think they saw uh, in part because of the global financial crisis, in part because of uh, perhaps uh, President Obama's uh, personality and approach that they could go for it, that they could just take advantage of the situation. This was, uh, they had, had enough clout at this point, and basically that there was not much that the U.S. would be willing to do. It was worth taking the risk. So we saw that first with the South China Sea and the um, militarization of, of the islands. And then I think uh, the Hong Kong situation, I think, is a little more, um, a little more complicated because I, I think um, the the distance, not just physical, but but um, metaphorical between uh, Hong Kong and Southern China has all but disappeared. And so from their domestic perspective, if you have uh, these unrest going on right on the border of Shenzhen in an area that is uh, that is now part of quote unquote part of China, then you will look weak uh, you, there were all sorts of domestic ramifications to that, and so at some point they just decided we are go we are willing to take the global um, political hit on this. Uh, back to Paul's uh, 
issue of or thoughts about um, soft power. And uh, we're, we're just at the end of the day, the ongoing uh, existence and prosperity, if you will, of the Communist Party is paramount. And so therefore, we're just going to have to go in and take them over. Um, what this has shown, I, you know, this is for those who have uh, spent a lot of time in Hong Kong and uh, have have been amazed in many ways at the, the city's development. Um, this is, you know, a, a, a just a, a real just you know, milestone and really, really serious. And I, the, I think what the events that have since then have, have indicated that what there's not much the world can do at the end of the day. There's not much that the world is willing to do. Um, there are sanctions, um, but China knew that probably going into it. Um, there's been some housing by financial companies a little bit, but they also want to maintain access to the massive Chinese market and the uh, massive financial opportunities that exist uh, going forward in China. So China made a bet. They reckoned with the costs and they went ahead. That's my read. Okay, I'm trying to keep track of the time here. It looks like we have a lot of questions. I think we'll get through three of them. And so first I'm going to call on Hajo Aiken followed by Don Young Chan and then Laura Sturdivant Dean. So first you. Hi, Joe. Hi. Oh, yes. Thanks, Lisa. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks, Mark. Uh, great perspective. Um, you focused on issues where U.S. and China are somewhat at odds. Um, one area where the Biden administration and current Chinese administration seem to be more aligned right now is on action on climate change. Do you see that as an area where finding common ground and then using that to identify pragmatic approaches to other areas where, where something can be done? is an option. For example, I'm thinking, my understanding is China does um, significantly, they, they, they seem to want to be abiding by the UN Sustainable Development Goals, which embed human rights and, and justice issues. And so, so the question is, is that a, would that be a way, focus on climate and, and other topics, a way around some of these obstacles that are difficult to, to resolve in the present configuration? Thanks. Thank you. Good, good question. Um, th so there, in my mind, there are a few dynamics going on with climate change. This has been the much touted area where the two need each other, where it's important that they work together. Um, but you're already seeing, I think, some uh, some sharp elbows even in this area. Um, uh, one is that I think you know you saw with Xi Jinping's speech at Davos, where he has you know quite uh, wisely from a, from a branding or what have you perspective has said that China is a global leader. We have set targets and we are going to be uh, at a time when the US has left the, um, ha has in many ways pulled out of Paris and was gone for four years, we're, we're uh, a natural global leader. The Biden administration having made uh, climate change a cornerstone and in many ways moved that into almost every part of the cabinet in a, in a substantive way um, is pushing back on that. And is, so you, I think you're gonna see a bit, of, uh, a bit of jockeying for global leadership in this area. Uh, the US is not willing to just uh, kind of abide by uh, what China has laid out uh, that it is a global leader on this. And one of the areas you're perhaps seeing is that in the latest five-year plan, China did not tie itself down on what would be peak year for coal and uh, its own targets on uh, uh, when it would stop building new coal-fired power plants, this sort of thing. So uh, I think there's gonna be more push to put your money where your mouth is. Uh, on some of the other issues that you speak of, human rights uh, is, <laughs> you know, good luck with that one, I think. Uh, uh, a related issue that we're going to see is much more sparring in the United Nations, I think, because uh, President Trump did not like the multilateralism or the whole concept. Uh, it's 
China was it has been able over time to put its people in positions of leadership. And so I think you're going to see a, a lot more um, pushback on that, um, especially the Chinese Chinese may have global political power, but they have they pay a fraction of the uh, dues and budgets of the UN compared to the US. So I think you're going to see a bit more of that. And Don Yan Chan, you're up. Next question. Hi, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay. Um, my question is regarding if any technology issues were discussed at the meeting, since um, it's been kind of playing a big role in a lot of the topics that were covered today, from everything from esports uh, activists, like uh, the one from Blizzard who tried to give support to the Hong Kong protest, but Blizzard ended up um, removing him or for about a year to the most recent um, still ongoing China and the like Tencent and these technology companies, um, how do you say, uh, issue of, of, can't think of the word today, maybe because it's a Monday, but <laughs> <laughs> Um, the technology being copyright issues. I mean, oh, was, intellectual property. And, yeah, Violations, and all yeah. that kind of all those issues. Right. Was that discussed in the meetings today, or was there just too much on the plate for both sides to um, talk about it? So the the purpose of the meeting, I think, I think uh, perhaps the the Chinese would have liked to get down in the weeds, particularly on issues of tariffs, on issues of. Uh, denial of Huawei's access to the market, 5G, um, the uh, where social media companies go. Uh, the U.S. was very clear that it did not want to get uh, into that level of detail at this point. Um, they, they're not. The U.S. is not ready to really engage on the nitty gritty. Uh, they're they're going to bide more time. One of the areas where I think you have some of the greatest differences among the uh, alliance that the um, that the U.S. Uh, Biden administration is trying to put together is over technology. Uh, they agree generally on intellectual property rights. They tend, I think, the coalition tends to agree be pretty much on the same page when it comes to state subsidies or state-owned enterprises fighting against um, private companies. But the technology issue is is much more difficult. I think certain uh, allies feel that you should be able to sell certain things to China. Others are much more hardline on that. Um, it, the one hacking certainly was raised at the at the meeting, uh, particularly this uh, giant Microsoft hack that was that's been attributed to um, the Chinese government in the last couple of weeks. Although it happened earlier, it just came to light. Um, but the short answer is no, it really did not. We have a ways to go before we kind of get, get to that level. Thank you. And Laura, Sturdivant Dean. Hi, uh, first off, thank you for, for taking time to chat with us. This is awesome. Um, now I'd like to, my question kind of brings it home, pun intended for us in Alaska. And um, I love how you talked about with China um, being more conceptual and us being more tactical in nature. That has been a theme in our history, in our foreign relations for a while. Taking that, and I would like to uh, hear your thoughts on the future of the Arctic between both nations and our relationship, since that is obviously near and dear to our heart here in Alaska. Thank you. Uh, you know, actually, that's one of the things that I'm talking to uh, people up here, and it's a, it's a it's an area of great interest. Um, uh, and so I think the, the Chinese have a worldview, perhaps, coming out of the Middle Kingdom, the, being the center, conceptually the center of the world, um, that there's no area where they should not have a voice, a growing voice in. And that, so they have created this kind of near Arctic power concept. Um, 
I don't know if the Belton Road, the Belton Road is a slippery one. It's, you cannot find a map uh, in China that has exactly what the Belton Road is. Um, you kind of have to cobble it together. And in many ways, it's, it's very classic Chinese um, branding where they take a, a large collection of policies that they already have and put a slap a name on it. Uh, so I haven't yet seen uh, the Belt and Road uh, make it to the Arctic, but <laughs> I think it will, it will be a matter of time. Um, I guess the, the, the playbook, not, I'm not hearing this from China, obviously, but the playbook that I'm hearing from talking to experts is that what you do uh, in, in very much probably uh, an echo of the uh, age of imperialism in the 19th century <clears throat> with the British Empire and others is you expand your uh, commercial interests in the area the, through shipping, through perhaps exploration, and then you uh, start to defend your interests perhaps with military assets, and then you take it from there. Um, an interesting thing to watch, I think, in this area is whether, to what extent, uh, Russia and China will join forces uh, because, you know, uh, nothing near about Russia's claims to being uh, an Arctic power. Um, but these are very, very wary uh, frenemies, uh, the two of them. And, um, you know, in many ways, the opening to the West, to the US, uh, by Mao was a response to needing to balance and recalibrate uh, their relationship with Russia or Soviet Union at that time. So, um, so I think that's a close one to watch. Uh, if they're both feeling threatened enough by the US that you could see uh, some close level of cooperation there, uh, all else being equal, they, there, is, there are big differences between the two. So uh, it's, you know, to be, to, you know, to, to watch, to watch closely, very closely. Yeah, it's a good question. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Mark, for, for watching that closely. It's something here in Alaska that we do watch very closely. We know that President Xi Jinping in 2018 announced his plans to extend it through the Arctic, something that we think about a lot and appreciate more eyeballs from people like you. So, so thank you very much. And thank you for joining us, everyone here today at the Alaska World Affairs Council and for supporting our commitment to bringing quality educational programs to you and our passion to increase all of our global competency. If you have any questions or comments or suggestions, please send them our way. A warm thank you to our featured speaker, Mr. Mark Manier, and a special introduction by President and CEO of World Affairs Council of America, Bill Clifford. We look forward to seeing everyone again soon, hopefully this Friday. I hope you all join us. We are gonna be talking about income inequality during the pandemic and continuing on this discussion. We hope to see everyone on Friday and have a great rest of your day. Thank you, everyone.